This video will explain the concept of control flow integrity or CFI. Control flow integrity is a software security policy that dictates that software execution must follow a path defined by a control flow graph or a CFG. This control flow graph is determined statically ahead. Source code analysis, binary analysis or execution profiling are possible techniques to define a valid control flow graph. In this paper, static analysis of binaries was used. The attack model. The researchers start from a rather pessimistic attack model. They presume a powerful adversary that has full control over the data memory. This view has a number of virtues. First, this assumption makes formal definition and analysis a lot easier. Secondly, buffer overflows and other data corruption attacks can lead to arbitrary changes in data memory. So these are all covered by the attack model. So what does this mean in the field? CFI verification can prevent all attacks that are based on influencing the control flow of a program. For example, a buffer overflow that is used to change the return address will be detected. More recent attacks like heap-based jump to libc attacks can also twar be thwarted. Fine-grained CFI can even protect against powerful return-oriented programming attacks. However, later on in this video, we will see some exceptions on this. Attacks that don't require the chains of control flow, like format string attacks, are not avoided with CFI. Other attacks that still adhere to the original control flow are still possible. Practically, CFI is enforced by verifying the destination of dynamic control instructions. These include computed jumps and computed calls and return instructions. All these instructions are possibilities for an attacker to tamper with the control flow of a running program. An attacker can jump to anywhere in the code, whether this is the entry point of a function or not. For variable length instruction architectures, an attacker can even use bytes that are not meant to be instructions, but that form by chance valid opcodes. In order to avoid this, CFI greatly restricts the number of targets for these instructions. Let's have a look at a practical example. The sort to function can be used to sort two arrays. This function calls twice the sort function. This function requires a function pointer as an argument that will be used as a comparator. In this case, both LT and GT are comparators. On the right hand side, you can see the control flow graph that was determined based on this code. The tick arrows, starting from the sort function, and the return instructions are all computed jumps that pose possible threats to the control flow integrity. The calls to the sort2 function, however, are not computed and pose no threat. CFI verification will add labels to all possible destinations and checks to all possible sources from computed jumps. Here we can see that after each call to the sort function in function sort2, labels are added. Because of these locations are valid addresses to return to after the sort function has finished. This slide shows how checks and IDs can be implemented. On the left side, we can see the source, the code from where we make a computed jump. On the right side, we can see a valid destination of the jump. There are two versions displayed. However, the first version still contains a very subtle problem. Let's have a look at the first version. We see that a label has been added to the destination. Before jumping, the code checks if the destination does indeed hold that ID. Even if an attacker was able to change the value of the register ECX, the check will fail, because that destination will not match the ID. As you will see later on, this only works if the ID is unique in the binary. However, if we implement the, ch uh, the check as in this example, we can be sure that is not the case. That is because we added the ID directly as a literal to the, uh, the compare instruction. So now we have two locations in the binary that hold the ID. The ID itself and the immediate operand of the compare instruction. An attacker could still use this because he can jump to this jump if not equal instruction. The second uh, version addresses this problem by not using the ID literally in the operands. The ID minus one is loaded and later on incremented. CFI makes three assumptions that must be fulfilled in order to guarantee protection. First of all, there is the unique constraint. 
Like explained in the previous slide, each ID must be a unique. An ID may only be present only once in the entire binary. This includes the bytes of the opcodes that may by chance match an ID. Secondly, CFI requires non-executable data. Otherwise, it would be very easy for an attacker to add codes in the form of data, let that data start with a spe specific ID, and redirect the flow of control to that address. Thirdly, non-writable code must be present. If this should not be the case, an attack could possibly circumvent CFI checks simply by overwriting them or overwriting their ID labels. The last two assumptions nowadays pose little problems. Write XR execute memory protection policies are widely enforced in computer systems. This policy exactly covers these assumptions. The unique constraint can be checked and enforced by the static analysis tool that instruments the binaries with CFI verification. However, these assumptions can be somewhat problematic in the presence of self-modifying code, runtime code generation, and dynamic loading of code. Further research might be required in these fields. Fortunately, most software is rather static. Because CFI uses a finite static control flow graph, it cannot ensure that the function call returns to the call site most recently used for invoking the function. For example, when we have a recursive function, CFI can't tell how deep the program is in the recursion. At the moment, we have no way to ensure last in, first out behavior of the function invocation. In order to fix this deficiency, a runtime call stack can be used. However, we have to be very carefully to rely on runtime information that is kept in memory, since we go out from an attack model in which the attacker has complete control over data memory. Therefore, a protected shadow call stack is required. We must be sure that an attacker can't modify the contents of the shadow call stack. The paper suggests the use of an isolated x86 segment, which actually results in efficient hardware support. The segment is isolated from other accessible memory segments. Segments are not widely used anymore, so normally this shouldn't pose any problems on the semantics of a, proper, a program. Because we use CFI verification, we can be sure that an attacker is not able to jump to certain instructions that perform operations on this segment. The segment can be set up by the program itself when it's loaded, or the setup can be done by the operating system when it's supported. The researchers measured the overhead of these inline CFI enforcements on some of the common spec computation benchmarks. This was done on a Pentium 4 x86 processor clocked at 1.8 GHz. The figure shows the results of these tests. It indicates how much overhead CFI introduced in percentages. Overall, the measured performance overhead seems tolerable. CFI enforcement is comp competitive with most comparable techniques that aim to mitigate security vulnerabilities. The benchmarks report an overhead of 18% on average and a maximum of 45. Other applications of CFI. Software fault isolation is designed to emulate traditional memory protection. In SFI, a check is inserted at each machine code instruction that accesses memory to ensure that the target memory address lies within a certain range. This introduces two major problems. First of all, a powerful attacker can simply circumvent all added checks, making SFI basically useless. Secondly, all these additional checks can lead to quite a large overhead. CFI can be used to solve both of these problems. Control flow integrity, as we have been explaining, greatly restricts the means of an attacker to change the flow of a program. Any attempts to avoid SFI checks by jumping around them are thereby thwarted. A lot of SFI checks can also be dropped because they have become redundant. CFI can ensure of entire blocks of code that they will be indeed executed as blocks. An attacker will not be able to jump to the middle of a block. Each SFI check can therefore be done only once in a single block. In many cases, this means substantial optimization of SFI. CFI can be implemented on different levels of precision. Preferably, we want CFI to be as precise as possible. 
IDs and ID checks may be more permissive than necessary. Take for example this situation. We have two points in the code that call functions dynamically. Point A can call function f1. Point B, however, can fu call function f1 and f2. Now, how can we now label function f1 and f2 in order to validate the control flow? In coarse grained CFI, we could just give them both the same label. This means that function f2 can still be incorrectly returned to point A in the code without detection. Some coarse grained implementations go even further and allow a return to go anywhere in the code as long as it's after a dynamic call instruction. The reasoning behind this is that even with this loss in precision, CFI is still restrictive enough to be satisfactory. Functions can, for example, not return in the middle of another function. Fine-grained CFI, however, would try to make sure that function F2 can only be returned to point B. This can be done in a couple of ways. First of all, we could use multiple labels for a more precise control flow graph. Point B then has to check a set of possible destinations instead of a single label. We could also make use of code duplication. We could make a copy of function F2 that is only available for point A and the original F function F1 can then be reached from B. Fine grade uh, CFI however comes at a cost. It can introduce more overhead because of the extra complexity. However, as we will see later on, coarse grain CFI might not always be as safe as initially thought. We can further classify coarse grain CFI implementations based on the optimizations they take. First of all, the checks for dynamic function call and related return instructions can be more slack. Secondly, some CFI implementations take a whole other approach. They are based on heuristics to detect suspicious control flow behavior instead of hard checks. A good example is to count the number of instructions executed between two consecutive indirect branches. Attacks on control flow will typically result in an increased number of branch instructions. Thirdly, CFI implementations can deviate from each other based on when they apply runtime checks. Some implementations only opt to perform checks at security critical points in the code. This table shows some ad academic proposals for the approach to coarse grained CFI. Each column summarizes how precise each approach enforces different kinds of CFI. Even a combination of all these coarse grained CFI policies still allows for a rub attack to take place. What you can see here in this slide is a summary of gadgets. This list of gadgets was constructed on a state of the art coarse grained CFI protected Windows kernel. They were specifically engineered to bypass the defenses. Although the performance boost of a coarse-grained CFI implementation might sound tempting, in the end is fine-grained CFI still required to achieve reliable security.